chemicals that lower sperm count and shrink penises. What's really in my moisturiser? We spend $100 million a year on moisturisers. They're one of the most commonly used cosmetic products. I don't know many women who don't use it, and most of us on a daily basis. But what's actually in moisturiser and what's it doing for us? Moisturiser is, is the name given to uh, uh, products which uh, increase the water content in the skin. Sounds simple enough, but it does get more complicated. First though, I want to understand how moisturisers work, so I have to understand the problem. Dry skin. The normal water content of the skin is only 10 to 20 percent. If our skin's moisture content drops below that, it feels dry. Changes in that are, are, are determined by external factors. How dry is it? How windy is it? By internal factors, so our ability to retain water in the skin. How well our skin holds water in depends on the skin barrier, which is made up of three important components. The first is the uppermost layer of densely packed dead skin cells. New skin cells are produced at the base of the epidermis. As they move up, they die, flatten out like roof tiles, creating a solid barrier. In between is a mixture of fats and water-loving chemicals called the natural moisturising factor. Finally, a layer of oily sebum seals the barrier that stops water escaping. Anything that disrupts this barrier can cause dry skin. Moisturisers are a popular and easy fix. These days there's hundreds to choose from. It's a pretty crowded market, which is why the marketers have their sights set on our men. But what do men know about moisturising? I'm here in the very heart of Kiwi Blokedom. Eden Park! To put moisturisers to the test. It's going to take hard graft to get this place ready for the World Cup next year. So what better place to find man skin in need of a little TLC? We've asked eight hard-working blokes to put four moisturisers to the test and tell us which one they liked best. None of these guys currently use a moisturiser. No, no, I've never used me like Don't intend to either. No, I certainly wouldn't buy a moisturiser. The ladies love it, but the guys think you're gay. Although they deny it, many get started in the habit by pilfering it from the women around them. I've never used my wife's moisturiser, no, definitely not. We've slipped a popular woman's brand in amongst the men's products in our experiment. After all, the only difference between men and women's moisturisers is the fragrance. The basic ingredients of any moisturiser are always the same. First, there are the humectants. Humectants are the equivalent of our skin's natural moisturising factors. They are chemicals that attract water to themselves and hold on to it. The dead, dry layer of the surface of the skin is above a lower, live, wet layer of skin, and the humectants actually pull water up from that lower layer and hydrate the upper layer, which makes the skin feel better. There are no serious health concerns with these types of ingredients. In fact, they're often identical to our own natural moisturising factors. Urea, glycerin and ceramides are good examples. Moisturisers also seal water in with occlusives. These are oils or fats that work the same way as our skin's natural oil or sebum. And these chemicals actually form a barrier. They're a sort of waxy barrier on the surface of the skin that stops you losing water. Common ones are plant oils and their synthetic relatives, petrolatum and mineral oils. Occlusives can clog pores and there is some concern about contaminants in mineral oil. More on that later. Finally, moisturisers contain ingredients called emollients. And these are molecules that are fatty type molecules and they go into the skin and just make it feel better because it feels softer. Common types are lanolin and cocoa or shea butter. Altogether, these ingredients work to soothe and soften our skin and keep our own natural moisture in, but the effect is strictly temporary. Generally, they take uh, 15 minutes to half an hour to, to start having an, an effect, and the effect probably only lasts uh, between two and four hours before it wears off. Four hours isn't very long, but many of us are used to putting moisturiser on several times a day. That's okay, isn't it? 
or is it? One of the difficulties is if you put a moisturizer on, your skin produces less natural moisturizing factors. So it wears off more quickly. So what do you do? You put some more moisturizer on. So you actually become dependent, almost addicted, to having a moisturizer on your skin. So according to some experts, our skin's better off left to its own devices, at least when we're young. But that changes as we age. From the age of 50 onwards, though, our barrier function starts to diminish. There's less natural moisturizing factors in the skin, there's less sebum being produced, our skin starts to dry out. And that's the time to start using moisturizers, is from 50 onwards, they definitely have a benefit. But prior to that, they probably don't do very much. So if most of us don't actually need moisturiser, how come we buy so much of it? And how have marketers convinced us to pay hundreds of dollars for it? You could call it a hype premium, but marketers say what you're actually buying is not mere moisturiser, but a dream in a bottle. Here we have Kate Winslet. So what does Kate Winslet mean to you? I guess Kate is somebody who's successful at what she does. She's a mum, she's friendly, got a great smile. She's on top of the game. Perfect. This is an essence of a certain archetype of womanhood. We're taking this, we're attaching it to a brand, we're putting it in a little package. And you can take a little bit of that, put it on the cheek, and instant Kate Winslet. Celebrity endorsements are just one way to get us to shell out for a premium product. Clever marketing also convinces us to pay huge sums for tiny amounts of moisturiser. Well, the first thing we see is a large gold top, and the gold indicates precious and unusual. They're also made of very heavy glass, which has got a feel to it in a way that a plastic package can't possibly convey. I notice that it's also quite small and expensive. These are both uh, retail for about $100, $100. But you get what you pay for. And that's it's, the association. Is that true, though? Do we really get what we pay for? In some sense, we do. It may not be true in terms of the product that's in there, but in terms of what we feel about the product, how we feel about ourselves when we use it, yes, we get more pleasure from an expensive product than from a cheap product. I have got a product that I paid a fortune for, and when I put it on, I feel like I'm just giving my face love. Which is exactly the point. Expensive products are probably no better at moisturizing than the budget version. But moisturising has always been as much about our perceptions as our budget. Back to our moisturising males, let's find out what they think of moisturiser A. It's $60, the most expensive one in our test. Had a bad smell and it was also hard to rub in. I like moisturiser A because it wasn't oily, um, it wasn't that greasy as well, it smelled real good and my girlfriend liked it of course, so that's why I like it. Um, it gives a good feeling on the face and hopefully it's um, working as it's supposed to. After the break, could moisturisers make men less manly? Men should be worried about effects on sperm count, undescended testes, and those sort of changes. And how easy is it to fool consumers? Wow, I'm very shocked right now. 